next uh, presentation will, will be given by Maria Hachaturian, uh, who is from Helsinki University Humanities Program, and <coughs> and her title is "Knowing is Knowing is Belonging: Recognitional Dexis and the Emergence of Common Ground in Religious Conversion." Thank you very much. I'd, um, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me and giving me a chance to present at this great venue, and I'm looking forward to the discussion in the next couple of days. A remarkable feature of key political texts of the history of the United States uh, is the use of the first person plural pronoun we, as in we hold these truths to be self-evident in the Declaration of Independence. Uh, in we, the people of the, uh, the United States, the opening phrase of the uh, Constitution, or we are engaged in a great civil war in Lincoln's uh, Gettysburg Address. Uh, the little inclusive word we, as Michael Silverstein called it in his analysis of the Gettysburg Address, creates the very group if it refers to. In particular, as in the Declaration of Independence, uh, according to Derrida, the we who solemnly published and declared that these united colonies ought to be free and independent states, these we free themselves, create themselves as freed, uh, I quote, at the instant of and by the signature of the Declaration. All these we enact or performance a certain subjectivity, even if the performative momentum differs in case of each text. In other words, we projects a certain participatory framework, a certain framework of co-engagement in a political process. That we seems to be a peculiar feature of American political texts. It's not found in key contemporaneous texts in other places, such as the French Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, produced some 20 years uh, after the American Declaration of Independence. The French Declaration begins by les représentants du peuple français, uh, but uh, they representatives of the French people, not nous les représentants du peuple français, we the representatives of the French people. We, um, uh, nous is not found in the French Constitution as well, and uns communistes and we the communists appear only later in the manifesto of the Communist Party, which instead begins as a third person narrative. However, the performative work that we does is hardly unique. As I will argue in this paper, what we does could be analyzed as an instance of indexical performativity. My focus will be on indexical grammatical categories or dikes, although the analysis could be extended to non-grammatical indexicality as well. To borrow William Hanks' definition, dietic systems define points of intersection between linguistic structure and the social settings in which speech takes place. More specifically, dictic categories reflect the relation between, on the one hand, the indexical origo, or the participant frameworks, and the roles within it occupied by the communicative agents, the speaker, the addressee, and the, uh, uh, the, speaker, the, addressee, and the objects of reference, uh, on the other hand. Typically, such a configuration implies that the origo object relation uh, is always given, exists prior to the utterance in question. The didactic markers index, as it were, the existing relation between the origo and the object. In the illuminating article by Paul Friedrich, it was shown that didactic codic categories, in his case it was second person pronouns in honorific function in, in Russian, have the capacity of what he called switching or breakthrough. By giving several illustrative examples from Russian prose from the two last centuries, Friedrich argues, and very convincingly for a Russian speaker who I am, that a subtle choice of the fiction, that the fiction characters make of a pronominal form is an effective means to index the degree of formality of the relationship and uh, uh, relative social position of the interlocutors. But what is more, the same choice can contribute to that interpersonal dynamics. Um, thus providing a breakthrough in the relationship between the characters. Uh, in the latter case, instead of indexing a given interpersonal relationship, the dictic form projects it. That inverse relation between a dictic form and the context of its usage, breakthrough, projection, instead of indexing, is another example of what I will call uh, indexical performativity. Uh, by its very utterance, a dictic form adjusts the context of its use. In addition to the speaker and addressee pronominal forms, a wealth of other didactic markers can be used in the performative function, some of which directly contribute to the participatory dynamics. I am now turning to my main object of study, the demonstratives as they are used by the members of the mono-Catholic community in West Africa. Conversion to Christianity in Guinea and in the forest Guinea region in particular is very much an ongoing process. With many competing denominations, Protestant and Roman Catholic, 
uh, limited resources and little institutional pressure, the Catholic Church in many respects could be characterized as grassroots. The life of the community depends crucially on the activity of ordinary members and much less on the church hierarchy. From gathering and uh, control over the resources to the very efforts of proselytizing, all these activities are essentially done by lay people. This semi-institutionalized nature of the church is especially apparent in the organization and religious practice of the Catholic community of the mono-ethnic group, and in particular in their usage of religious documents. Many of the routine religious texts, such as prayers and chants, were translated by mono laymen, and new versions continue to be created. Most unexpectedly, while a translation of the New Testament into Mano published in Liberia in 78, uh, 1978 is available and has a certain amount of usage by the community, more often than not, the Mano prefer to translate the Bible themselves, producing spontaneous oral uh, translations of relevant parts of the Bible. Thus, while the order of worship and the ritual performance remain regimented and predefined, as is typical of Roman Catholicism, the readings from the Bible, along with the sermon, of course, become the main sites of improvisation, but also, as we will see, of stylistic differences between the speakers. These spontaneous oral Bible translations and the particularities of their language are the main objects of this study. Special attention is paid to the didactic marking of nominal expressions. Consider the example one in your handout, uh, which comes from a recording of a Sunday uh, celebration. Wala kaleke Nazareth yawea ye inyegbabo Isaiah sebe yagea ka. Literally, it means in the house of God that was in that Nazareth when he finished reading that book of Isaiah. This passage is a translation of a phrase that introduces some verses uh, from Luke. Uh, and it's not part of the gospel, the phrase itself, it's rather a free summary of the context that, uh, which allows to situate the subsequent verses. The French source, because the text was translated orally from French, and uh, uh, the, uh, English the English translation of that French source, source are the following. En ce temps-là, dans la synagogue de Nazareth, après la lecture du livre d'Isaïe, Jésus déclara. At that moment, in the synagogue of Nazareth, after the reading of the book of Isaiah, Jesus declared. In the Mano translation, the expressions Isaiah la Sebe and Nazareth uh, are followed by the distal demonstrative Ah, that book of Isaiah or that Nazareth. The demonstrative is not used in an exaphoric function pointing to objects present in the interactive scene as naturally the book of Isaiah and Nazareth are nowhere near. Nor is it an example of the anaphoric function of pointing to reference which were introduced in prior discourse because this utterance happens to be at the very beginning of the reading and there is no prior discourse on the topic, nor was the book of Isaiah read on that day. Potentially, the demonstrative ah uh, can be used in all these functions, but this specific context of use rules out such possibility. What we have here could be characterized as an instance of the recognitional function of the demonstratives. Recognitional dyxis, according to Himmelmann and Diesel, is used where the uh, identifiability of the referent relies essentially on the ability of the addressee or the addressees to recognize it on the basis of her and the speaker's common ground. Recognitional function also appears in example two, spin that wheel, the formula which is vocalized by the entire Paramount Theater in Oakland, California. That in that wheel is used to refer to some pre-existing pieces of context, more specifically common knowledge. Before the movie starts, there's a lottery accompanied by, uh, by a spinning of the Wheel of Fortune. You can see it on the picture, picture here. Um, and all the frequenters of the Paramount Theater know it, and I also came to know it. Um, in other words, the existence of the referent, uh, the knowledge of which is shared, that wheel is presupposed. But let's look at another example from English taken from the menu of the Cliff House restaurant in San Francisco. Uh, don't forget to stop at the gift shop. Pick up that special gift or souvenir for that special person. In this case, the recognitional function of the demonstratives works as an indexical projection. Indeed, the referent may have been non-existent before a visitor of the Cliff House read the advertisement. She may not have had a special person in mind, nor uh, uh, the intention to buy a gift for anyone. But the success of the advertisement is achieved precisely when the referent of that gift and that special person appears in the mind of the visitor. 
Thus, if that will is an example of non-performative recognitional, that gift is an example of performative indexicality and performative recognition. Coming back to the mono case, recognitional marking is common uh, in mono speech outside the church as well, of course. The following example is example four uh, in your handout is taken from my field notes. A woman, my host, is speaking to her contractual worker with whom she had made an arrangement to help her with the harvest of the rice. She says that tomorrow we will beat that rice. Both tomorrow and, and rice are marked with the demonstrative uh, ya, yeah, it's uh, a variant of a ah, that, that was just introduced. Uh, and they refer to entities that are made recognizable by a prior arrangement. As she explained to me when I asked her uh, to comment on her usage of the demonstrative, she said, everybody knows that I have to go tomorrow to my field to work. Uh, in our first example, both Nazareth and the book of Isaiah are prominent reference uh, which uh, anyone who has spent at least a year in church will recognize. Just like with the rice in example four, uh, the use of demonstrative in this case could be characterized as recognitional proper. But let's look at another example, example five. He came with those domestic animals of his at that border of the savanna at Horeb that was atop of that mountain of gods. Uh, the new international version says, uh, uh, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. This example contains three instances of the Yah demonstrative, but we will consider only the bold ones. These bold uh, ones, uh, that border uh, of, uh, in the Mano translation, it's that border of the Savannah and uh, Horeb, they are clearly recognitional because it's the first time the reference are introduced. The border of a desert, so the desert was translated as Savannah uh, and the Horeb mountain. Claiming and framing a mountain or the border of a desert as recognizable would be counterintuitive at best, if not counterfactual. Well, I don't know where a New Testamental desert or a mountain are situated, and I assume that mono-Catholics don't know either. I, I argue instead that recognitional marking in religious language does not have to describe a real state of affairs, recognizability of the reference, but may rather be performative. The reference do not have to be, in effect, known by everybody, uh, but they are presented as if they were known. Recognitional marking serves to performatively project background knowledge, which is intrinsically collective, and forms a common ground of the religious community of Mano Catholics. The usage of recognitional diocese implies a certain information management ability that requires a position of power. And indeed, those who get to orally translate the Bible are no simple members of the community. Only prayer leaders and uh, priests get to do it. However, not all community leaders, and not on every occasion, use recognitional diocese in their Bible translations. I have recorded a speech of one catechist, three prayer leaders, and two priests, and only one prayer le leader and one priest show the discussed particularities. Uh, therefore, the use of recognitional markers not only becomes a property of the religious register of authoritative church members, but also a feature of their personal style. I managed to obtain some translations of the same excerpts which convincingly show the differences in personal styles of at least some speakers. To have those parallel uh, examples, I had to be in, in two places at the same time because the readings of the Bible are, are made at the same time in, in every village community. But uh, sometimes it was possible to make those double recordings. So consider example six, which compares the speech of two prayer leaders, A and F. Uh, so example 6a, uh, uh, he will change our bodies, it's uh, the prayer leader A, and uh, example 6b, uh, it is him who will change those bodies of ours, it's the prayer leader F, and the New International Version, it's uh, Jesus Christ will transform our lowly bodies. It's only the prayer leader F, uh, he, it is him who will change those bodies of ours, uh, who uses the recognitional marker. There are indication, uh, indications in the social backgrounds of the speaker, uh, speakers which may be held responsible for the difference in their style. In the case of the two prayer leaders, there are differences in the socioeconomic background. For example, F, uh, who uses their recognitionals, has a much higher social standing than uh, A, A. However, it seems that the crucial factor contributing to the choice of, to use the recognitional markers is not so much the general position of authority which the role uh, of a prayer leader or a priest 
provides, nor some reinforcement by the socio-economical capital that the speakers possess outside the church, but more important seems to be the relationship between a prayer leader or a priest, uh, I, I'm not giving examples this time, and his community, and especially whether the priest or a prayer leader uh, uh, is local to the community or not. Indeed, F, who uses uh, recognitionals the most, serves in his native village, while A is foreign to the church community to which his Bible translations were addressed. Therefore, the possibility of management of common ground needed for the use of recognitional markers appear, uh, appears to be dependent on the existence of a privileged access to the community and membership in it. I now proceed to a theoretical discussion arguing that the recognitional marking could be, could be seen not as indexing of specific properties of context, mutually known referent as part of the common ground, but rather performatively projecting contextual features, namely the existence of common ground and of the community sharing that common ground. I have already argued that recognitional diaxis has a context creating performative capacity. I will now formulate an approach linking religious conversion to religious common ground and of the common ground to community building. Then I suggest looking at the assertion of common knowledge as a performative strategy. Finally, I focus on the way common ground projection becomes a fu function of propositional stance and the way it shapes and reflects social relationships. According to Tal al-Assad, in medieval Christianity, the authoritative discourses, the teachings and practices of the church had a primacy over the convictions of the practitioner. According to Assad, in medieval Christianity, belief was built on practical and theological knowledge. Familiar, I quote, familiarity with all such religious knowledge was a precondition for normal social life and belief embodied in practice and discourse and orientation for effective activity in it, end of quote. While belief as a private disposition may still play an important role for a member of a contemporary Christian community, perhaps uh, especially in Protestantism, all Christian practice inevitably involves a considerable amount of specialized knowledge. In medieval to modern Christianity, the church space has a precise structure, the color elements of which uh, remain invariant, such as the crucifix, spaces dedicated to the priest or the prayer leaders, a space for the choir, a space for the congregation. Similarly, speech is an important part of the Christian common ground, as much of the verbal part of a Christian ritual, such as prayers, uh, is predetermined and learned by heart by the community. On a more general level, membership in the community always entails knowledge sharing. Uh, I cite Clark, common ground is the sum of the information that people assume they share. Common ground rarely becomes explicit, however, it underlies virtually all everyday activity. In the same way as community membership involves having common ground, common ground can serve as a definition of a social community. Now I'm, I'm quoting Schutz, the subjective meaning the group has for its members consists in their knowledge of a common situation and with it of common system of typification and relevances. Similarly, practical and theological knowledge, but also mental and corporeal dispositions may be seen as a common ground of religious practitioners and uh, much of the verbal and non-verbal activity may be predicated on a presupposition of such knowledge. In contrast to Clark, who takes common ground for granted as something already there, albeit at the level of mutual assumptions, I argue that the presupposition of common knowledge doesn't have to be given. Instead of presupposing common ground assessed by interlocutors on the basis of their knowledge of a situation, for example, community co-membership, linguistic expressions such as recognitionals may instead project common ground. I will now discuss the work by Jurczak, who makes a similar kind of argument. One of the foci of uh, Jurczak's 2005 book is increasing uh, uniformity and predictability of official language of the late Soviet uh, period. One of the key communicative features of the official language was that all types of information, new and old, were presented as knowledge previously asserted and commonly known. In linguistic terms, information was presented as presupposed. That backgrounding and presupposition of information was achieved not only on the discourse level, such as manifest intertextuality, as well as narrative and rhetorical circularity, but also at the level of the grammar. 
One of the formal features through which such backgrounding was framed was the use of complex modifiers. Thus, the complex expression, uh, Jurczak gives this example, the high level of social consciousness, tricks the, re the reader into perceiving social consciousness as already existing, as a known fact rather than a contested claim. Indeed, to be high, social consciousness must exist, and to be measured comparatively by levels, high level or low level, it also must exist. While Yurchak places the performative dimension of authoritative discourse in, Sovi in the Soviet Union at the level of production and reception, arguing that texts were divorced from literal constative meaning and used ritually, I suggest that the performative momentum starts already in the choice of the form. Indeed, as uh, Yurchak uh, suggests himself, himself framed as presuppositions, ideas are treated as obvious, taken for granted fact without necessarily being such. In the very framing of ideas as presuppositions, it is, sorry, the very framing of ideas as presuppositions uh, that creates the performative effect of the taken for granted of a piece of information presenting it at, as a universal truth. Yurchak argues that information backgrounding served the purpose of discourse and anonymization and transformation of the authors into mediators of previously established knowledge and universal truth. In addition to that, I argue that in Bakhtinian terms, presupposition creation can be claimed to have a dialogic nature. Indeed, when a speaker frames a piece of information as given and known, it must be known not only to the speaker, uh, sorry, it must be known not only to the speaker, but also assumed to be known or performatively established as known uh, to the addressee. The addressee in Yurchak's case, given the omnipresent character of official discourse in the Soviet Union, is the majority of the country's population, those uh, that adhere ritually to the form of official discourse. Therefore, the propagation of normalized, standardized official discourse grounded in implicit presuppositions not only created an anonymized author mediator, but also created a uniform public implicitly adhered to those presuppositions. Similarly, in my case, by performatively framing information as presupposed and part of the common ground, a mono priest or prayer leader creates a collective which shares that common ground. In other words, the, the operation of projection of common ground becomes an operation of community projection. Performative presupposition does not operate at the level of a single utterance or even a single text. The portability, citationality, and replicability in the case analyzed by Yurchak make individual operations on presuppositions at the constative level of the language must, much less important than their prominence at the level of the register as a whole. In the Mano case, uh, although certain but not all recognitional expressions make sense individually as they index reference that can be considered prominent in Christian doctrine such as Nazareth or the Book of Isaiah, framing of some of the reference as recognizable such as the Horeb mountain or even more so an unspecified border of an unnamed desert is counterintuitive if not counterfactual. However, common ground projection should not be treated in any literal content-based sense. A specific choice of referring expression, marking of noun phrases as known and recognizable by the, by the interlocutors, is made by some speakers more frequently than by others. Given the ubiquity of recognitionals in the speech of certain individuals, recognitionals are best described as a feature of, feature of personal style of certain speakers and, uh, to borrowing uh, Asifaga's term, the propositional stance that a speaker tends uh, to adopt. The propositional stance is not arbitrary, but is grounded in a personal background and the speaker's analysis of the communicative situation and, uh, in particular, the membership analysis, as argued by Aga and Sheglov. Thus, not only do recognitionals operate as a projection of the presupposition of recognizability of reference, but through this projection, as an assertion of the existence of the community of knowledge-sharing coinciders. Crucially, that very assertion depends on the pre-existing relationship between the speaker and the community and the sense of co-membership built on independent grounds. Uh, to conclude, this paper is grounded in a discussion of grammatical data, namely the usage of demonstrative markers in the Bible translations orally produced by mono ritual specialists. A previously understudied genre, these oral translations are shown to be intrinsically related to the context of their production, as the patterns of usage of demonstrative markers depend on the social position of the speaker and his relationship with the, the church community. 
the argument focuses on a specific value of this demonstrative, the so-called recognitional function, which is used when the demonstrative frames a referent whose knowledge the speaker assumes to share with his or her addressee as part of their common ground. In many cases, however, the reference cannot be recognized by many, if not all, members of the congregation, which adds a performative dimension to the recognitional usage. The reference do not have to be, in effect, known by everybody, but they are presented as if they were known. Moreover, due to its ubiquity in the speech of certain individuals, recognitional uh, demonstratives in part lose their function of mar marking recognizability of individual reference and become features of personal style. On a different level, I argue that the assertion of common knowledge in Bible translation is tied to the fact that religious conversion implies acquisition and sharing of practical and doctrinal knowledge. As with any community, a religious community gets to share a considerable amount of common ground, which in part defines its very existence. By performatively projecting the presupposition of common knowledge, the ritual specialist, a priest or a prayer leader, at the same time brings about the community that shares this knowledge and his in-group relationship with the community. Crucially, it's not, uh, if, uh, it's not, it is only sorry, if a ritual specialist already has some privileged ties uh, with the community, with his village community in particular, that he may resort to performative presupposition management and reinforce that community in speech. Thus, through a delicate two-way operation of a reflection of contextual relationship and at the same time a projection of that relationship, recognition of dyxis contributes to a discursive formation of religious community which emerges as a community of coinciders sharing a common ground. But the performative magic of the uh, indexical projection does not create community ex nihilo, but predicates it on uh, relationships existing on independent ground. As a word of warning from Pierre Bourdieu, one, uh, I, I, I quote, one only preaches to the converted, and the miracle of symbolic efficacy disappears if one sees that the magic of words merely releases the springs, the dispositions, which are wound up beforehand, end of quote. Returning to my more general point about indexical performativity, performative potential of indexicals has been recognized. We saw that personal pronouns have this capacity, and also Silverstein in his famous Shifter ar uh, article uh, mentions uh, the honorifics in general. Uh, I hope to have shown that demonstratives also have this context-creating capacity. But similarly, evidentiality, but also tense aspect, have been analyzed from a performative angle, which gives an idea of the pervasiveness of the phenomenon of indexical performativity. Thank you.